Hi, everyone. My name is Chad Blevins. I'm based in Vienna, Virginia, just outside of DC. I'm a geographer, uh, OpenStreetMap volunteer. I've been working with the community for about a decade now, believe it or not. And I'm one of the co-founders of Youth Mapper. So uh, put together some slides, just want to go through them, tell you more about the program, kind of how it got started. Ironically, uh, like in, well, I guess about a month from now is going to be the five-year anniversary just crazy. Um, so we're almost, we're almost at that five year mark. Um, but yeah, we'll kind of just talk about where we started and, and how we got there. Um, so Youth Mappers, this is this program we started uh, five years ago. I'll give you some history there, but our tagline is we're creating a new generation of maps for the world as well as a new generation of mappers. So it's been such a joy for me to work with you know, uh, such amazing students. I know we have a lot of them on the line, so thanks for tuning in. Um, so how did this how did this project start? I mean, really, if, if you look back at the history of OSM, that big earthquake in, in Haiti, you know, sh sh was a shake to the OpenStreetMap community. And that was the first time that, you know, OpenStreetMap, or one of the first times it was used at a large scale for uh, international response. Um, so at the time I was working at USAID, and there was this desire to get a high resolution map of Kathmandu in Nepal um, to support the USA like official contingency plan for Nepal. Like if there's an earthquake that happens in Kathmandu, what are we gonna do? We wanna be prepared before that happens. Lessons learned from Haiti. Um, <clears throat> so at the, I was working with the Geo Center and um, it turns out we, we started investigating and looking for this map you know, thinking OSM would be a viable option. I uh, came across our friends at the World Bank who were also uh, interested in mapping in Nepal. They actually had started a local team there working with Kathmandu Living Labs and uh, the students at Kathmandu University going out and doing an assessment of schools and hospitals in the valley. And as you know, what they were running into is that there wasn't a good enough base map available for them to get into some of these side roads and little alleyways to find all the schools, right? They were looking essentially at a blank map. So um, this was the time where I was working with a colleague, Shadrock Roberts and I. Um, and so we started, you know, how are we gonna find people to help us map this? We wanna help out. Uh, so we started cold calling universities and came across George Washington. Um, and they were, they were willing to help, they had a bunch of student uh, GIS classes that came together for a big mapathon one night. It was over, over 100 students and we got most of it mapped as you can see here. And then that allowed the students in Nepal to go through and fill in all the details. Well, that was a, it was a really amazing experience to see something like that uh, come to life for the first time. And my boss at the time, Carrie Stokes, uh, did not go unnoticed to her. And so she was you know, thinking about ways to Kind of scale that process, which happened, you know, basically in one night over over a couple weeks span. Um, you know, the real impact from that work was two years later when the Gorkha earthquake hit Nepal. So it didn't affect Kathmandu directly. It it did actually, um, but it wasn't the epicenter was not right on that Kathmandu, so it could have been a lot worse. Um, but the map of Kathmandu was very detailed and, you know, something that came from that first mapathon two years before was there was this surge of local mappers in Nepal and, you know, by that time we had enough grown the, the youth mappers community a little bit, even though it hadn't officially launched yet, we had kind of reached out and been doing some trainings and testings and there was sort of this beginning of the network starting to form and the data we created was used. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, the program launched almost five years ago next month um, and currently consists of 222 chapters in 50 countries around the world. So it's really grown fast. These are all student-led chapters. So it's basically a, a, <clears throat> a sanctioned club at the university and they go through the paperwork that they need and then, you know, every year or every semester, you know, they'll bring in new officers who run the club and organize events and do outreach emails and coordinate mapping events and um, 
you know, Facebook pages and social media and all of that. So what, what does it mean to be a youth mapper and what does signing up and joining the program actually mean? Well, there's a variety of different things that are available um, for students and probably the biggest benefit, oh, 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 sorry, um, are the, I got my little Zoom thing is blocking my screen. I'm sorry. The youth, uh, the youth, the fellowships. Um, so every year, except for the year of the world with the hell, right? We've had this fellowship where we select out of the whole network of uh, youth mappers network, we bring together about 20 students from countries across the world, continents across the world. There's always like U.S. students in there as well, and we'll go to some place in the world. The first uh, one was in Nepal. Just kind of that's where the project got its roots. Um, we work with the local communities there um, and take these students through, you know, a series of like training and leadership training and technical training and research project training. Um, and then they go back and they'll carry out local projects with their, you know, in the places where they live. Um, there's also virtual internships. So uh, while I was with USAID for three years, I ran a virtual internship program, right? This was all pre-COVID and we're gonna launch a international program next year at some point to bring in international students. But that was um, the virtual internship program for the US. I've got a couple students, I think, tuned in tonight. Well, uh, it's uh, only available if you're a chapter in good standing. There's typically, I'd say around 15 students from about 10 or so different universities all across the US. It was really cool. So we'd come together on uh, video chats, you know, go through some technical training of OSM and then, you know, they would do some mapping uh, afterwards to support a specific project. Uh, a couple years ago, we also launched the Validation Hub at George Washington University, which is where it's based. I believe now they're actually working with students outside of GW. Um, it's run by Richard Hinton, a professor there. But what uh, the Validation Hub is doing is these students are going through all of the past Youth Mappers projects. You know, we had this big surge of mapping and everyone wanted to map, but there was no validation that was being done. You know, we weren't trained in validating. So we had to get smart on that, working with our friends at HOT. So slowly over time, we've, you know, picked up the pace of validation and we're cleaning up the data. Um, sometimes it's, it's been mapped a while ago, but either way, we're coming back and making sure that it's all good. Um, just for a couple of use cases of, you know, what the interns and what the volunteer students have been mapping for. Um, <clears throat> I think this was probably 2016 and 17. We did a lot of work to support the President's Malaria in Initiative with indoor residual spraying, um, particularly in Rwanda, but also in Kenya, in um, Uganda, in Mozambique, and one other place, I think it's Zambia. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Zambia. So indoor residual spraying, they literally, someone will go door to door with the you know, protective equipment on as you see here, and they'll spray the inside of the building with an insecticide that kills mosquitoes, that's harmless to people. And then they'll put some, you know, this picture marking on the, on the structure or in some cases, if they have the data, you know, they can use it for tagging on the tablet, or at least like they know where these structures are, they can plan uh, routes more efficiently to get out and go support these projects. And the, the, the indoor residual spring, it's like a $100 million annual investment by the US government. So it's a pretty big uh, effort. And so these maps were super helpful to that type of work. Uh, there's lots of these examples. I only picked two to talk about tonight. Um, wasn't sure, you know, how much you guys want to hear, but if you want to learn more, I'm always happy to talk about this. Uh, this example was uh, some work we did in Uganda with the Global um, Bureau for Global Health at USAID, and this was supporting the Saving Mothers Giving Life uh, Accessibility Analysis. So they wanted to understand 
where women, well, how far women were from uh, facilities that could give them access for, you know, childbirth, actually birthing the child and then, you know, services even beforehand and then afterwards, just so women could get the help that they needed. And, you know, in order to do that, roads are <laughs> how people travel around, right? So, and the quality of the roads and the size of those roads has a lot to do with how fast you can go on them. So what we did is we've mapped out the entire road network and a couple districts in Uganda, and it's a pretty big area, right? Rural, but big. Um, and that was an interesting project because it was one of the only times we've done a strictly road focused project. Uh, and I'll, you know, the community came in afterwards and validated all the data. And it was almost perfect by the time we were done. Um, and it was used to actually in like a scientific, you know, the, the results were published in a scientific journal um, showing you know, how this open database could be used to support the investment of development dollars overseas. Um, okay, gosh, I hope I don't get messed up here. So what does all this add up to, right? And we have this cool little map, the activity map that we call it on the website. So you can go to activity.youthmappers.org. Right, let's see if this is gonna, all right, oh boy. Um, let me get that out of here. Okay, so going back to 2015, um, you can see here, yes, there are some map, uh, there has been some mapping done uh, before we started Youth Mappers. Some of the, the chapters and students, you know, this map is created strictly by username. So every time a Youth Mappers chapter starts, they put their usernames in and that goes into the database and Jennings Anderson actually built this uh, little graphic here. But as you go along, um, you know, 2015, there was some cyclones in the Philippines. You can see that area is kind of lit up. Uh, sometime around here was the Nepal earthquake. You can see some heavy action taking place then. Um, this is when Ghana, right about now is when the chapter at Case, Cape Coast and other places in Ghana sort of out of the pop-up. You can see the mapping that we did in uh, Mozambique down there. There's a bunch of mapping that was done. Um, also some in Uganda for the malaria prevention um, started to get involved in the uh, work in Bangladesh, more cyclones in the Philippines. Um, somewhere around here, you can see some cyclones going through in the Caribbean as well. Uh, just kind of moving along here. There was a big effort in uh, Zambia and Botswana with the humanitarian open street map team. They did some competitions. That's where that big red blob came from. Uh, we get, we're getting more chapters in Central America. And let's see, a lot more action taking place in Ghana. We did some work there for agriculture um, assessments. And let's see, some more action in South America. And you basically get the picture. So um, <clears throat> this is a cool little tool to, to play with. You can also search by user, you can search by you know, which chapter has the most activity um, and can look at some of the numbers, how many roads we've done overall on the time scale, um, accumulated mapping activity. So it really has been um, kind of a cool, let me see here, sharing the screen, stop sharing. All right, let me try. It's been, a, it's been a cool program to take part of. You know, we had no idea what was going to happen when we started. Here's my son. Yeah. He should be in bed. <laughs> um, you know, when we did that first project with GW, it was like, oh, this is cool. Maybe we could get like a couple chapters involved or maybe, you know, 30. I remember thinking 30 would be such a big number. And now we have tons and tons. So uh, it's really been a fun project to take part in. So, uh, you know, having this, this vast network of hundreds of universities all across the world, and this happened in a very short time. I remember for the 100 week mark, we had um, 100 chapters, right? So we were picking up the pace of one new chapter per week. Um, so it kind of was something that was hard to keep track of. Um, 
hard to get all those individual chapters assistance that they needed, answer questions that they, they had, and also make sure that they had the training so they weren't just going in there and creating bad data. Because we, you know, this is a learning experience. So we do expect students to have a, you know, a little bit of a learning curve as anyone in the community. Um, but we feel that, you know, working directly with GIS, a lot of the, or geography students, you know, they have kind of an upper hand to some of this because they understand the geospatial technologies to some degree. So they can just kind of pick up and start running with it. Uh, but that said, they all do need training. So a couple of years ago, we started this um, regional ambassador program and we put a call out and got some really good proposals from, you know, leading students at chapters around the world. A lot, a lot of times they were like the chapter presidents or someone who had a lot of experience with building and supporting the community locally and abroad. Um, so they got these grants and they were able to then reach out to schools within their country and you know, create new chapters, hold training sessions, take on and fund some small local projects. Um, and as you see here, this, um, these two women right here is Laura and Stella um, from Kenya and Uganda. They're two youth mapper students that traveled to um, Addis Ababa and helped start a local chapter there and held a training for a couple of days and went back. Um, that's, you know, that the traveling part of the regional ambassador program has slowed down right this year, but they have still been working virtually and making sure that some of those new chapters get the, the support that they need. Um, <clears throat> and then there's also, you know, projects that the students take on without themselves. And this is one here in Akure, Nigeria, a student of ours, Tim Adayo, um, took on a trash mapping project. Um, and he kind of inspired me. So you'll see this trash sites logo on here. And this is kind of a, a little pet project and I'm, pu I'm putting in my plug here <laughs> for, uh, but it's something that I'm working on with support from my boss, uh, Todd Slynn at Critigen. Um, where I'm now working as a consultant. So we're trying to uh, create something around, you know, mapping trash sites and open street map. And, you know, Tim Adayo hasn't been the only student that has been interested in mapping the trash in their towns. And, you know, where does it go? Where does trash originate, right? Uh, at your house? And where does it go from there to a dumpster? And then does a truck pick it up? Or is there someone that comes by with a cart? And then where do they take it? Oh, maybe to the landfill. And, you know, are there people that come through and pick trash out of the landfill and then take it to somewhere else for recycling or payment? Um, if there are, then, you know, are there ways that the trash can be divided up or you can kind of disrupt that, that current trash life cycle or value chain as, it's, as it stands with geospatial information and get a better sense of how the trash is moving around and why you're seeing pictures like you see here on the right, um, you know, when large, small, medium-sized cities all around the world. So I am um, talked with uh, some students in Zambia who are interested in, in doing some local projects on this, um, as well as in Kenya. I had a call with a former fellow just this morning um, who found that I was you know, working on this trash sites comp concept. And he's like, hey, I want to help do this. It sounds like a great idea. We have trash all over you know, the part of Nairobi where I'm living. Um, so if any of you are interested in, in trash mapping um, and want to help out on this, on this project, you know, feel free to reach out and let me know. Um, we're kind of right at the very beginning here, but I want to build out some guidance and get it to where students, you know, even in the U.S. can go around and map all the trash cans on campus and, you know, talk with the, the people who are, who are taking that off campus and where is it going and we're just kind of like a... <clears throat> trying to break through at, at the time where, you know, people are actually stopping recycling and, you know, trash is piling up even more. Um, yeah, uh, and that's it. There's my Twitter handle there at GeoCruiser, my Gmail address. Uh, happy to take some questions, talk with anyone at any point about more about the program or specific ways that you could work with students at any of the universities out there.